Good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 25th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Can I remind everybody to switch off their mobile phones as they do affect uh, the broadcasting system. Uh, agenda item one is items in private. Can I seek the agreement of the committee to take item four in private, that is to consider the outcome of the review of the implementation of the 2012 homelessness commitment. Is that agreed? That is agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is draft budget scrutiny. Today uh, we will hear evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2015-16. This year, the committee is focusing its budget scrutiny on three of the Scottish Government's national performance figures, namely reducing Scotland's carbon footprint, reducing traffic congestion, and increasing the proportion of journeys to work by public or active travel. So in order to assist us with that scrutiny today, I welcome Karen Campbell, Head of Policy and Operation for Homes for Scotland, Dr Richard Dixon, Director of Friends of the Earth Scotland, and John Lauder, Director of Sustrans Scotland, both of whom are representing Stock Climate Care Scotland, Alan Ferguson, Chair of Existing Homes Alliance Scotland, and Mark Tate, Director of Community Broadband Scotland. So can I welcome you all. <clears throat> can I perhaps start off by asking, uh, do, you, uh, do any of you have any opening remarks on the draft budget 2015-16 in relation to whether it will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, just in sort of general terms? Richard, have you drawn the short straw this morning to start off? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Good morning, committee. Um, I'd like to start by saying, of course, that the imperative to take action on climate change has been reinforced over the weekend with the finalisation of the, the big intergovernmental panel on climate change report saying what the science tells us, where we might be going, which might be six and a half degrees rather than the two degrees where supposed to be aiming for as an absolute maximum. And Ban Ki-moon said on Sunday, with this latest report, science has spoken yet again and with much more clarity. Time is not on our side. Leaders must act. And Scotland, in many ways, has been a leader in terms of setting targets. Um, the RPP2 is a document which has its deficiencies, which we might come on to, but there is probably not another document like this in Western Europe, so in one sense it's a very exciting thing. In terms of what will this budget do, so that's the key question, what will this budget do for our targets? Um, the conclusion, and I think you heard this from the academics last week, is we can't really tell. So section 94 of the Climate Change Act, which you all know by heart, says that Scottish ministers must, amongst other things, lay before the Scottish Parliament a document describing the direct and indirect impact on greenhouse gas emissions of the activities to be funded by virtue of the proposals, i.e. the budget. So the Scottish Government has produced for you this document that you've all seen, the carbon assessment, and this is a very narrow interpretation of that statement in the Climate Change Act. So to me, this, is, this report is delivering on the letter of the Climate Change Act, or perhaps not even that, but certainly not on the spirit of it. So if I might go through the three key documents which the government is pointing you at. One is the carbon assessment, uh, but it only covers really the carbon costs, not the carbon benefits of the proposals, and I'll say something about that in a second. They also say, well, you should read that, and you should also look at the RPP. So the RPP is the list of, as you know, proposals and actual policies. It's not necessarily up to date. The government has announced some other things since this came out, and it's not easy to tell which of these policies are on track and which are not. It's not easy to tell which of the proposals are working their way towards being policies, as they should be. And you may remember that in the discussion around this document, to deliver our climate targets, actually to miss quite a few of them, but only just miss them and get to the target in 2020, we have to fully deliver on every policy in here, so nothing can go wrong, all got to be delivered, and we've got to, in a timely fashion, as defined in here, turn every proposal into a policy which also is delivered fully. So there is no room for falling back on any of this, but you can't really tell where we're at with this, so you can't compare these two documents easily. 
And then there's a third document that is in preparation, which the government tell me you will have soon, but which you don't yet have. And this is last year's version. And this is looking at the policies in the RPP and the money in the budget and saying whether the right amount of money is going in to fund the policies as envisaged in this document. So you have, when you get this one, you will have three quarters of the picture because you will have how much emissions will the spending create, you will have how many of the policies are properly funded, but you won't have the final quarter, which is uh, what does that actually mean in carbon terms. So I brought a little visual aid to amuse you and to demonstrate what I think the government should be telling you, which is this. Does the budget reduce emissions and make a very serious contribution to the one million tonnes of carbon that we need to save in the next year? Or does it do the opposite and actually increase emissions or make only such a small reduction that it's not going to deliver on our one million tonne reduction? So to me, that's what Section 94 of the Climate Change Act, the government should be giving you this very clear message. This budget will take us in the right direction or this budget actually won't. And you can't tell from the information in front of you. So I would say to you that the, that, that commitment in Section 94 is not being delivered by the information the government is putting in front of you. The third document I've mentioned, this is last year's, isn't ready yet, so you won't necessarily see that before you've finished your scrutiny. I can't tell you anything about it because I haven't seen it. You may not see it before you see the minister. So again, you, you're lacking in information at the time when you should be asking these questions. We will get it this week before we see the Minister next week. Okay. And the, the document you're referring to is details of funding for climate change mitigation measures. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. So it will tell you about the money, but it won't complete the picture and tell you about the carbon. So if I may say briefly something about the carbon assessment report. Um, in some ways, it's a very impressive document. It's got a wealth of detail. It calculates lots of very interesting things. It takes on a huge challenge of trying to translate the budget into carbon terms, and that's a very difficult task. And when this was first done, it was probably a world-leading kind of document. There are other people who have kind of ca ca caught up and perhaps overtaken, but it's still an interesting analysis. It even goes as far as estimating how much carbon emissions will result from the government money that goes into NHS and teachers' pensions, for instance. So there's some really quite impressive calculations behind doing that. But as I say, it only gives you a partial picture, and I'll give you two illustrations of that. It says in here, if you just read the tables at the back, that the rail franchise funding and the funding for rail infrastructure will result in 300,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide being emitted. So it doesn't talk about the fact that people travelling on those trains will probably not, therefore, be travelling in a car. And so there's a significant carbon saving. So when we open the Borders Railway, for instance, there will be a lot of people who are now on the train, not in a car, who were previously in a car, and so there is a, a, a significant carbon saving, but that's not quantified anywhere. In the opposite kind of way, it tells you that the Queen's Ferry crossing will cause 66,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide in the coming year because of the budget spend. That's all about construction, but what it doesn't tell you is what new traffic will be generated and how much extra carbon that will produce, which will be much larger than those 66 tonnes. So it's giving you only half the picture. So I'd suggest to you that when you speak to the minister, you may like to ask, next year, can we combine all of the information that they're trying to give you into just the one document, but take it that extra step forward so that it comes to a final conclusion, like my visual aid, does this budget take us in the right direction or the wrong direction in terms of meeting our targets in the future? That's an extra piece of work. This is a big piece of work, so it's, it's not as if they're not already doing detailed calculations. It's certainly not impossible to come to you with that overall number, but you are lacking it now. So, and uh, in terms of which of these is it, well, this budget is rather like previous budgets. And since we've missed the last few climate targets, that suggests that we're more in this territory, that this budget is, whilst it's got some really good measures in it, which do the right things for carbon, it's got too many measures that take us in the wrong direction. So it is very likely 
that this budget actually takes us in uh, a direction of increasing carbon or at least certainly not reducing it enough to meet our targets. But I can't tell you exactly because we can't do those numbers because the government hasn't completed that picture. Does anybody else want to come in on that? Can I just make a, a general comment? Thank you for the um, invite to Exist and Homes Alliance. Um, um, can I start just by mentioning that you know, I, I believe the that means to recognise the commitment and work of the government in uh, trying to reduce carbon emissions through improving housing conditions and tackling fuel poverty. I'm obviously concerned with uh, homes and those homes that are going to be with us for some time, around 80% of the homes in 2050, sorry, 2050 will, are, are already built. So housing quality standard, energy efficiency in social housing, sustainable housing strategy, examining ways to transform the market, the resources government spending are all crucial. Uh, but, not, but more needs to be done. And it's in that context, our view is that the, the monies in the draft budget are in, insufficient and will not reduce emissions. And unless we improve energy efficiency more, um, unless we tackle the problem of uh, poor housing in rural, in rural areas or elsewhere, we won't hit the overall targets on emissions, we won't hit the overall targets on fuel poverty, and we won't improve the well-being of many people in Scotland. So the budget, as far as we're concerned, whilst it goes a long way, as Richard already said, is insufficient to both improve energy efficiency uh, and to reduce emissions. Okay, thanks. We'll come on to look at housing in, in more detail um, later. But, um, Richard, in terms of what you said, um, I think, obviously, we've missed annual targets, but in the long term, I mean, and we talk about, you know, construction projects like the Borders Railway, um, you know, even building houses creates uh, car greenhouse gas emissions. So, in the long term... Um, are we going to get there? So I think the, the conclusion you would have to draw is that, um, uh, of course, investing in sustainable infrastructure has a carbon cost. So nothing is free. If we're moving from fossil fuel energy to renewable energy, if we're building more railways and less roads, we're still building things. We're still pouring concrete, importing steel, we are still creating a carbon impact. So, of course, it's perfectly reasonable that there is a carbon expenditure. The other side of the calculation that we don't have is how much carbon benefit will that bring, not only next year, but, of course, in the long term. So, And this committee particularly is, is the most interesting one because you're thinking about the concrete we pour next year. What will that mean in 20 years' time for carbon emissions? So if it's concrete that's poured to make very nice cycle paths through our towns and cities... That's rather different from building the Queen's Ferry Bridge. Uh, so we can't answer that question because the work hasn't been done to do it. As I've suggested, that work could be done. So the answer is not as simple as what does this year's budget do because, of course, um, much of what's being invested in will, will have an impact in years to come and some of it will have an increasing impact. So if we, for instance, when we finish the Queen's Ferry Bridge that will generate new traffic. So we know that new roads generate new traffic and we know that bridges in particular, if you create extra capacity, you generate new traffic in a big way. So that will have an ongoing, increasing carbon impact because the day it opens, a few people will think, oh, there's a nice new bridge, I'll go and drive across that. But as the years go by, more and more people will do that until it is completely chocker. Uh, and the same is true of cycling infrastructure. The more you, you invest in cycling infrastructure, the day it opens, some people will think, oh, that's nice, I'll try that out. But as we've seen throughout the last couple of decades, where we've invested in cycling infrastructure, it takes some years for people to build up the idea that actually, oh, it's great, I can safely cycle in the, on this cycle path to my work, to do my shopping, to go to school, etc. So it will take a while for these things to have an impact. So that's also the kind of calculation we do, we need to do. But of course, those are the kind of calculations that were done for the RPP. And again, the RPP is only about the good things and what carbon impact will they have. And it rather ignores the bad things we might do 
or the things which are bad in carbon terms, and the impact they might, they might have. So we need that kind of assessment done again every year on the budget to say this spending will result next year in this, but for the 2020 target, this is what it will mean. For the 2050 target, some of the things we're investing in today will still be there, still be having an impact. This is what it means for that. So we can't tell you, but as I say, you would guess because we've missed some targets, we're clearly not doing enough. So we're trying quite hard. We have a plan which is very nearly good enough, uh, but we're not doing enough to meet our targets. This budget, it has good measures in it. Some of them are funded to a greater degree than previously, but most of them are about the same. So that suggests we're not doing enough extra effort to catch up with where we need to be and to actually hit our targets. So I can't tell you that, show you that in numbers, but that's the obvious conclusion you would draw, thinking the budget's quite similar, we're not meeting our targets, therefore we can't see the extra effort you would expect in this budget to show that actually we're going to meet our targets. So extra effort on insulating homes, extra effort on active travel and public transport, extra effort on energy. And it's not as if we don't know what to do. We have this plan, which has lots of good things in it. We have real practical schemes, so much of what the Scottish Government has done on energy efficiency for homes is very well designed to have a good impact. It's just we're not doing enough of it. So we just need to put more money into the same stuff to achieve things faster. The same on much of the transport investment on sustainable transport. We know the right things to do, but we need to do more of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Gordon, do you want to continue this theme? Yeah, thanks. Much, convener. Um, <coughs> much of my first question has actually been covered about the uh, government's carbon assessment, so I'll, I'll move on to the, the second question. Last week, in uh, evidence to this committee, Professor Rolf said... It's quite easy to develop transparent accounting systems. We have the carbon accountants who can do it. They could develop a Scottish methodology for carbon accounting in communities or cities that would use Scottish rules and Scottish assumptions. So my questions are, do any of your organisations use carbon accounting to monitor trends? If so, what do you consider to be best practice carbon accounting methodologies? And what would be the benefits of adopting that best practice? I'm quite happy to, to pick up on that. Um, I read the transcript of last week and you, you had a um, discussion with Professor Annabel uh, in which she said that it was quite difficult to estimate the carbon saved by people cycling. Um, and we use a calculation uh, ourselves in our work which allows us to give a, a calculation of what the National Cycle Network is saving. So it kind of follows on from what Richard was saying. And the process that we use... Um, involves having face-to-face um, -face interviews with people using infrastructure that has been constructed. We call those root user intercept surveys. And um, out of that, we are able then to calculate those people who've been using the path who chose to use their bicycle or to walk rather than use their car. And out of that, we create a calculation which is an estimation of car kilometres replaced. And from that, we can then use the internet-based transport appraisal gu guidance called WebTag, which the Department for, Tran for Transport uses to then uh, calculate the um, carbon saved. And then using a calculation by the Department for Energy and Climate Change, we can give a monetary value to the carbon that's been saved. So it is actually possible to come up with a calculation. We think that that's best practice, which is what we use and what the government statisticians are happy that we present to them when we present our annual report. And it's what allows us to give a, a value to the carbon that the National Cycle Network is saving. Now, both those calculations are indeed Department for Transport. So whether they're Scotland specific is a really good question. I can't answer it. I think it's well worth investigating um, to see. It might be, um, I would like to sort of, you know, do a, a benefit to cost analysis of, of whether the effort's worth it or whether the calculation's actually a sound one and we should just use it anyway. But in our field, that's the calculation that we use. And so in terms of carbon accounting, that's what allows us to give the government an analysis of what Richard was saying, which is, yes, we are spending money building infrastructure for walking and cycling, but this is the benefit of that investment over the long term. And one of the comments that Professor Rolf said last week was that the trouble with the larger Department of Energy and Climate Change accounting system yes. is that use Westminster facing assumptions. There may be 20 different values for a certain factor 
that is putting in for England, where for Scotland's just one value. So do you use different values for different parts of the country? No, we would use the, the standard measurement that DFT have, which I think does, uh, I do agree with you, I think it's well worth exploring to see whether a Scottish analysis is better to use. And that's, that's the limit of my knowledge on, on that kind of statistical analysis, but I very welcome for our organisation to explore a bit more deeply if that would help. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Um, I'm conscious that I've spoken a lot so far. So very briefly. So just in terms of what the government is already doing, uh, in the RPP, there are tables which tell you, for instance, how much the zero waste plans, cutting down on landfill, etc., will um, save us in carbon terms. There are calculations that tell us how much planting more trees will save us in carbon terms. In the carbon assessment of the budget, as I've said, it tells you about pension spending and what that will do. It tells you about rail spending. So we are looking at both sides of the equation. We're not bringing them together, though, in an analysis that says, so what's the net impact? Are we going in the right direction or not? So, and the methodologies aren't exactly the same, so that needs to come together. But we're not far from having all the right numbers so that the government can come and tell every committee in your area and overall this is what the impact of this spending will be, positive or negative, on our climate targets. So we're not far from it. Uh, the, you know, we've got the methodologies already. They need to come together so that they're comparable and so we can take the positive and the negative side and mash them together to come to an answer. But actually, we're not far from it. I mean, the Scottish Government was one of the uh, first governments, if not the first government, to introduce this kind of statement. So yes. uh, is there any other best practice that we can... We can, is other other governments now up to speed with what uh, we are doing with carbon emissions? Uh, you know, can we learn any lessons from anybody abroad? There are certainly international initiatives, and there are companies which are trying to do the same kind of thing, looking at their impact every year and looking at, on going into the future, what their impact will be on carbon. So there are examples of good practice out there. As I say, we've got something, so we should be looking at how we make that work yeah. together, and we should be looking at that best practice so that. Uh, eventually, when lots of countries are doing this, we're all doing the same kind of thing, so that we can see when Germany says we're heading in the right direction and next year we'll save this much, mm. we can be using the same mm. system to say, well, actually, we're on about the same track, thank you very much, or let's learn from you because you're doing better from yeah. us. OK, thanks so much. Right, if we move on to uh, transport and active travel, Mark, you've got some questions. Yeah, thanks. Just a, a few questions on... Um, greenhouse gas emission impact of transport uh, congestion and sustainable and active travel. First one, um, just to ask the panel members if they think the current level of funding for um, supporting sustainable and active travel is adequate and also if the areas where that funding is being cha channelled is delivering the, the best outcomes. Uh, thank you for that. I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, I think that the funding is um, welcome, particularly the increase that we've had in the past year. Um, we're now on um, a, a sizable budget, larger than we've ever had before. Um, is it adequate? The evidence suggests that it's still not adequate, actually. Um, there's a fierce appetite to spend the funding that the government uh, gives Sustrans to manage, for example, which is match funded by local authorities. Um, We've been unable to match all the bids for funding that have come our way. So the evidence suggests that more funding that's put, it'll be, it'll be welcomed by um, local authorities and other partners which, who match our funding on a 50-50 basis. And that's through a project is, which is called Community Links, which does exactly as, as it suggests. It links communities together through generally shared uh, footways, uh, uh, which can be used for cycling uh, as well. Uh, this year, the budget for that particular project is £19 million. Um, it, it has been match-funded with £23 million from other partners, so they've outbid what's available in terms of the funding. And there are 41 partners delivering 180 projects across Scotland. 31 of those partners are local authorities, so there are 10 new uh, partners involved in this. They range from health boards to universities to Scottish Canals Forestry Commission. So I, I would suggest that there's an appetite, a growing appetite, and with uh, increased funding, I'm sure more can be done. 
where the funding is problematic is that the, the funding that we've uh, managed over the last year grew very quickly. And as a result of that, we had to work really, really hard to um, get our partners on board so they could find enough match funding to match what was available. With a more planned programme and a more predictive um, curve, if you like, trajectory of how much funding is available and when it's going to be available, local authorities in particular would be able to um, retrain some, some staff within transport teams, move people around and grow their teams so that they can uh, uh, take the funding that's available and deliver better, more meaningful and more challenging projects. So my recommendation to the committee is absolutely for more funding uh, to be made available for, for the active travel element. In terms of your question on, on congestion, um, the evidence would suggest that where infrastructure is available and is uh, high quality and well maintained and well um, publicised, it is heavily used. So use of the National Cycle Network has grown uh, by 7% in the past year. It took 104 million trips in 2013, which was shared equally between cycling and walking. So a significant increase year on year of infrastructure. So no doubt about it, when good infrastructure is put in place, uh, it's attractive, it's sensible, it connects people up to where they want to go, people will use it. Um, finally, the final element of that, in, in terms of the benefit to cost ratios, which Richard touched upon, they are uh, huge for uh, cycling infrastructure. Uh, highest uh, at the moment is 16.3 uh, to 1 in terms of a benefit to cost. So a very worthwhile investment tends to be a low-cost investment, heavily used, which we think um, delivers really well in terms of, re of reduced carbon emissions. Uh, in terms of congestion, I think that's harder to calculate because we're still at quite a low level of cycling. So I think it's difficult at the moment to say uh, what impact that's having. But it would be interesting to find out a bit more from, say, Edinburgh City Council, where um, journeys to work are now about 8% of journeys to work uh, are by bicycle and what impact that is having on congestion in the city. And I'm looking forward to hearing some more information from them in due course on that and maybe report back to the committee. Yeah. I think I'll probably come back to the congestion issue, but just to expand more on... Um, the funding issue and, and the match funding, you'd said that it, it was a, a pretty steep rise. Yes. Um, it, and it was a challenge for partners to come up with that match yes. funding, but still exceeded that by by £4 million. How, how much demand is out there in local authorities, um, health boards and, and other areas for that funding? And what would you say is a, a realistic ambition for that budget that, that partners would be able to, to match fund? I think there's a huge demand. Um, every time we've been given another lump sum increase, and this year we were given £7 million on, on top of what we already had, um, we've looked at that and went, wow, that's brilliant. How will we match that? And every time we find that we are outbid in terms of quality, in terms of quantity. So to, to my mind... Um, what we need to be able to do is to say to local authorities that over the next few years, this is how funding will increase. I would agree with the Association of Directors of Public Health that 10% of transport budgets being dedicated to active travel in terms of walking and cycling is the right uh, element to have budget-wise. And if we can say that to partners, what we will find is that, uh, more, as I say, more staff will move toward working around the transport team and more of the transport team time will be dedicated to a, a investment in walking and cycling infrastructure. And I, I, you know, I, I, I have to keep referencing Edinburgh on this one, Edinburgh City Council, simply because it's the City Council who's dedicated uh, an annual increment for active travel in its budget. I think it's now at 7% of the transport budget is dedicated to cycling. And as a result of that, the team who are delivering that infrastructure are growing in size. They're growing in importance internally. And what they're also doing now is they're collaborating with other teams within the local authority who otherwise wouldn't necessarily have worked with them. Um, so they're breaking through silos and, and growing a bigger team in terms of things like maintenance, winter treatment, urban realm planning. And to my mind, that's almost a model for how other local authorities will grow and will change how they deliver their urban realm work. 
Every uh, local authority has been invited to work with Sustrans using funding made available from Transport Scotland to have um, a strategic plan in place for active travel by the commencement of the 15-16 uh, financial year. We're very grateful for that funding. The funding is being managed by ourselves as an officer in place from Sustrans, but their work is guided by an advisory panel drawn from COSLA, government, local authorities themselves and other partners. And that officer is flat out working with local authorities who are either reviewing, revising or writing new active travel plans. So there is an appetite, there's an enthusiasm, there's a growing enthusiasm among the public, which you can see from things like the annual Pedal on Parliament event, which happens in the spring. Um, I think it's the it's this whole area is the growing element within transport, certainly at a local authority level. It's seen as the most interesting work that's available, um, and it's certainly the one where, generally speaking, the public seem very happy with and give strong approval to. So my recommendation is to in, is to increase the budget. Uh, my other recommendation, if, if, if I might be allowed to say, would be just to have greater clarity uh, around the budget line for active travel, because it is a little, it is still confused. It's quite difficult to work out what the budget will be next year, and that is a problem because I can have every sim sympathy with senior staff within local authorities who say, "Well, why should we reallocate resources to the active travel team when we don't know what budget they'll be managing a year from now?" Uh, that's that's a real issue, particularly when local authorities are are losing staff. Yep, that, that was going to be my final question, just on the sustainable and active travel budget line, whether that was clear enough, just how much funding was yeah. going to that active travel, so that's... that's you no, know, it's not clear, it's quite it's quite tricky to, in fact, it's very difficult to work it out. Um, the, the best analysis tends to come from Transform Scotland or the uh, Spokes, the Lothian cycling campaign, and, and they're struggling to, to map uh, where the funding is coming from. And as I say, the knock-on effect of that is it makes it more difficult for organisations like ourselves, who are tasked with helping to deliver the Cycling Action Plan vision, the shared vision of 10% of trips by 2020. It's quite difficult for us to get senior officers within local authorities and others on board if we can't give them real clarity on, here's the budget, this is the the way the budget will develop and there's every likelihood it will develop uh, and it will grow uh, year on year. So I, I, I know the committee did recommend to have greater clarity and I would welcome if that recommendation could be could be repeated and reflected in the budget. It would really help a lot. Okay, thanks. On going back to congestion, uh, do you think the uh, the balance of the, the transport budget across um, the various sectors is, is working towards um, reducing traffic congestion overall, has that budget been delivered to the greatest effect? Well, I, I, I recognise that the budget is, to, is delivering the, the plans and the commitments that are, are, that are in place. It's difficult, as Richard has said, to predict how that will work. The likelihood is that as you grow, uh, as you improve roads, as you create new uh, road infrastructure, so more people will take up the offer that's being made and we'll, and we'll use it. Whether that will lower congestion or whether congestion will maintain at the current level is hard to say. My, my instinct would be that the congestion may well grow. I think what, what is interesting, though, is that I think the budget could do more for um, public transport. I think it could do more for, for buses in particular. Um, what impact will the growth of active travel have in terms of congestion within cities and towns I think the emphasis I would place there is around the school run. We know that one in five journeys are related to school in the morning. That does create a lot of congestion. It can create congestion at key junctions uh, within towns and cities. I can't imagine there's any school that doesn't have an issue uh, around that, or uh, certainly the vast majority of schools have an issue around congestion. I think a lot more could be done there. OK. Yeah. Finally, on congestion and, and the budget. Are there any areas where you can see a conflict um, between um, the budget spending and reducing traffic congestion? Are there any um, conflicts between reducing congestion and improving um, or supporting sustainable and active travel and reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Are there areas of conflict or are there perhaps areas of of synergy where they're both working together? I think the, the two should complement each other. 
Um, it, it, it does follow from, and we know from evidence from other small northern European countries, that where you have a greater uptake in walking and cycling and public transport, congestion within towns and cities will reduce. Um, there is, of course, points of detail, uh, and particularly the right infrastructure needs to be built the right way, uh, safely to encourage more people to use it, and also to allow other modes, vehicular transport, to, to work efficiently while accommodating uh, growing numbers of people who are opting to use bicycles as well. Um, I think we in particular look to Denmark for solutions to that, where road reallocation has um, made a real difference in their cities and towns. But to be fair to ourselves in Scotland, we, you know, we shouldn't uh, beat ourselves up on that. I think there are some very good pilot projects around Scotland that are, are introducing meaningful infrastructure that can be used in uh, busy streets and towns, particularly uh, Waterloo Street in Glasgow, uh, which has a two-way Copenhagen-style uh, cycle lane, and Leith Walk in Edinburgh, which is being currently redesigned to accommodate all modes and give better facilities for pedestrians as well. So we need to get the infrastructure right. We know what to do. There simply isn't sufficient funding to allow us to do it to the level we would like to to make real meaningful impacts on congestion and carbon emissions. We've heard examples from a lot of the northern European countries on low carbon transport. Are there any other areas of low carbon transport that are being developed internationally that we could look to um, and, and bring in other pilot projects here in Scotland? Uh, I'm sure there are. It's not entirely my field. And I would bow to my colleagues in things like electric cars and hydrogen buses, but I think they're particularly meaningful and very meaningful in a, Euro in a rural context. Just to add to that, um, there's one area where we're potentially going to miss an opportunity or at least delay the opportunity, which is in the area of air pollution. So the government in about 10 days' time is going to release a new strategy on air quality where the subject of two complaints along with the UK in Europe about not meeting air quality targets. So about 2,000 people a year are dying because of air pollution in Scotland, most of it caused by traffic. So as well as climate change, as well as congestion, air pollution is another good reason to be changing the way we do transport, particularly in the cities. But in this budget, the amount of money dedicated to air quality and noise, which is the category where it's lumped together, is the same as last year. So although there will be a new strategy, and therefore presumably a new will to tackle this problem and do something about it, there will be no extra money. So it's hard to see how something that we could import from Europe, so particularly in some German cities, we have a low emission zone, we have a similar proposal in London, where you would not allow the most polluting vehicles into the centre of your cities and towns. It's a good idea, it's being discussed behind the scenes frequently. There's been a pilot study in Glasgow, but if there's no money, it's unlikely local authorities are really going to take that up. So there is an opportunity for some infrastructure, uh, some policy investment, which would improve congestion, move us more towards active modes of travel and clean up air in our cities and reduce um, climate emissions, but if there's no money in the budget for it, certainly no local authority is going to move on that in a hurry next year, and if there's money the year after, then we've, we've delayed again and wasted some time in something rather important. So I'd like to see some scrutiny on that line of the budget, where just over £3 million is going on air and noise. If that were increased, that would give a clear signal to local authorities that they're there is going to be something to help them do this, because it will cost them something to do it, although there will be many savings in doing it right. We, we heard the evidence um, at committee last week about um, intelligent transport options, um, uh, city car clubs, um, people making better use of their own private car um, for s sustainable transport. Are there any... Um, realistic options that, that are in the short to medium term in terms of intelligent transport um, city car clubs and options like that um, which the Scottish Government should be be looking at for um, more sustainable transport options 
Richard, in your view on that? I mean, I well, the, the uptake of the car clubs has been really promising. I think car ownership is dropping uh, in, in some cities where previously it wasn't, which indicates a good, where you have good public transport and good car clubs that will grow. Where there are options, I think the whole issue around transport is about choice. It's about giving people as much choice as possible. Uh, and a good, uh, relevant bus service, uh, just as important as well. Um, I struggle with the idea of intelligent driving driverless cars. I, I just haven't quite got my head around that yet at all. Uh, and I do worry a little bit about about chasing those kind of options when there are realistic, everyday, practical options that we know work and, and are working in other in other small countries. I think those, those would be the ones to follow. Yeah. Last question would just be a, a general one. Asked, asked if there are any uh, missed opportunities that you can see for um, developing a more sustainable transport um, infrastructure in Scotland? Well, I think that if this budget for active travel plateaus where it is now, it is in danger of missing an opportunity because, as I say, there is a, a growing appetite and a growing enthusiasm. There's a growing skill set amongst local authorities and other partners. And it would be entirely the wrong time to allow the, the funding just to stall. I think if it can keep moving up, even modestly, then we keep that curve on the right track. It, it will be challenging to reach the 10% vision of trips by bike by 2020, but it isn't impossible. With the right level of funding and the right support, it can be achieved. Um, so that would, my worry would be that, that would, we would miss the opportunity that we have in the sense of a growing awareness, a growing appetite, more senior officers taking an interest, other partners coming on board who we've never worked with before in terms of active travel projects, as I say, health boards, universities. That, to me, would be a key one. And that's the capital side. On the revenue side, it's very welcome that the Smarter Choices, Smarter Places funding of £5 million has been announced. And I think that will also capture an opportunity which is there at the moment, which is an appetite amongst the public to know more, to be more aware of the options that they have. So my plea would be not to allow this budget to, to plateau where it is at the moment. Okay, thank you. Yes. I think I'm just coming on, the, I know we're going to come on to, to digital. Um, but just uh, thinking about... Um, it's not a missed opportunity, but it is uh, an opportunity. Access to information about public transport, particularly in remote and rural Scotland, will have an impact on the use of that transport for visitors and for, for residents, uh, as I say, particularly in remote and rural areas. Um, and digital connectivity can uh, and will uh, bring that uh, access to information connectivity that, that, that people need in order to access public transport. Okay, thanks. Okay, anyone else got any comments on transport? Right, if we move on to housing, Adam, you'd like to start this. Uh, thank you. Um, this year's draft budget shows a very welcome increase in uh, uh, spending in housing and regeneration, something like £200 million. Um, now, we've, ha we've had many uh, representations made to, to us about the need to increase housing supply uh, in the country, but we're also being, uh, it's been pointed out to us, and Mr Ferguson did so already this morning, that home energy use accounts for something like 20% of Scotland's emissions. So this increase in the budget, while welcome, there are, there are obviously various uh, priorities that we need to we need to focus in on. Um, is it? Could you give me your views on um, the appropriateness of the target, the funding that's been targeted within the draft budget to meet these competing priorities? Can I start on, on housing supply? Um, in ho homes for Scotland, we, we represent the, the home builders in Scotland, so our interest um, with regard to the budget is, is, is very much on the supply agenda to build many more homes, as you say, um, we need. Um, 
and, and just in terms of bringing it back to, to the carbon agenda as well, just for context, um, the, the contribution that new build homes makes is through the building standards. And building standards in Scotland have already, they're already 70% more energy efficient. They, they mean that new homes built today are already 70% more energy efficient than they were in the base, which is 1990. That's the measurement that's drawn. Um, unfortunately, because we're building so few homes just now, um, the dent that we can actually make in the carbon footprint through new home building is, is very small. Um, I, I did some analysis previously on, on the RPP and looking at um, the contribution that new build will make through building standards. Um, it, it was estimated to be only 0.3% of the whole economy based on the, the low number of new homes that we're, we're building. So clearly, for, for new um, build homes to make a bigger dent, we need to be building more and replacing old, less efficient stock. Um, in terms of the budget for, for housing supply, we were really pleased to see such a focus um, and, and an increase given to, to housing. Um, a great chunk of that is on financial transactions, is through financial transactions due to the consequentials that the Scottish Government got through initiatives um, at UK level, in particular the Help to Buy um, scheme. And we're really keen, obviously, for, for um, more support to, to go um, to, to support that scheme and you know, happy to, to explore on that expand on that further. Um, I think um, another interesting point is, is the um, capital spend has increased, which has allowed um, a higher grant level to be given to the delivery of the affordable homes uh, target, which was required. I think um, there's a general um, feeling that the access to private uh, finance for RSLs and others to, to build homes, they were really struggling. So to, to meet that target, we needed to increase uh, grant levels available. And within that, interestingly, the, the, the grant is around 58,000 that's available per unit uh, for affordable housing supply on a social unit. And there's access to an extra £4,000 um, to support um, the delivery of a greener home, um, which is to meet sil silver standard within the aspirational standards contained within Section 7 of the building standards. Um, that is a welcome incentive because it clearly needs incentive to, to go above and beyond what are already high building standards because of the impact on build costs that that creates. So within homes that the government subsidises, that's, that's a really good thing. Um, the challenge we've got in terms of building mainstream homes at higher standards is there's no way of recouping those costs um, until the public begin to, to, to demand more energy efficient homes. And again, I can expand on that further later. Um, they be. But very welcome increase and very welcome um, attention across parliamentary parties on, on the housing agenda now. I think we're still on track to hit the uh, government's target on uh, new build. The question is whether that's enough. And I think up and down the country, there are real problems with supply and real problems with a need for housing. And certainly, that, and that's right across the board. There's no doubt that there is a need for more private housing. Um, there are still difficulties with people accessing those housing, though. And that's where we have seen, again, resources, but also a take-up on the mid-market rent um, by house associations uh, uh, and others. And that's missing a particular gap where people either can't afford to buy or can't get access, um, but also would not get a, a traditional social rented property from a house association or a council. There's no doubt, as Karen said, the increase in grant, the change in grant level last year has made a difference for a number of associations. They are now developing, whereas it's a struggle for them. But there are associations in some parts of the country who aren't developing, and therefore the problem remains, how do you meet the need for more housing? So the, whilst it's absolutely welcome that there is an increase in budget, there is a difficulty with whether that's enough resources to meet the needs in the constituencies up and down Scotland. The other side of it is your point is on the, the kind of emission side, and I think it's something like £79 million going to be spent around kind of fuel poverty and emissions. Um, last year, the existing Homes Alliance said that that needed to be at least 125000 the, um, uh, the government, uh, Mr Swinney, and the Minister for Housing and Welfare recognises that the cut in ECO uh, means a, a shortfall of some 50000 
million, uh, for 50 million. Um, that means that the 79 million, which is a similar figure from last year, has not been increased to take up the difference that government recognises there's a, there's a problem with eco. And indeed, the, uh, the UN Committee on Climate Change has said that Scottish government needs to be looking again at topping up more resources because of the shortfall in eco. So again, it's, it's um, to be welcomed that there are resources there or, uh, to tackle fuel poverty and emissions. The difficulty is, as other colleagues have said, uh, it's similar to last year and it's not enough to properly tackle the problem and to make up the shortfall through cuts in eco and elsewhere. Do you think would be an appropriate uh, budget for energy efficiency, uh, tackling en energy efficiency and fuel poverty? You say 79 million is not not sufficient. Um, what would be sufficient in your view? Uh, um, a year ago, um, in evidence, we said that, that should be at least 125 million. Um, if government itself recognises that there's a £50 million shortfall because of changes to ECO, then we would argue that it's at least 125 plus that £50 million. Right. So that's a more realistic. Now, you, uh, one of the difficulties, and it's the same with, with elsewhere, is quite difficult quantifying. And one of the things that we should be, uh, uh, we think that government should be doing is actually investigating itself and producing an analysis of what funding is actually required to meet its fuel poverty targets and the climate change targets. And that's one of the things that's still missing there, is the government itself is not doing that. So they are our estimates estimates for what, for what the existing Homes Alliance and its members think is at least 125 last year plus the shortfall in eco that the government itself recognises. Yeah. Your organisation and indeed Stop Climate Cares uh, suggests that energy efficiency needs to be a national infrastructure priority. Um, and what you're suggesting here is that uh, the way the budget is actually allocated um, it is not um, of an order that would suggest that that, that priority is being recognised. So well, what would you do in, in terms of assuming that we're, we've got a fixed budget that we have to, we, we have to balance every year, uh, how would you reallocate uh, the funding within, within what we've got? To me, it's recognising the, um, the importance of not just meeting the, the kind of carbon targets, not just meeting fuel uh, po uh, poverty targets, but it's recognising that the benefits of you know a kind of a warm home have on the well-being of those who live in that home, on the asset that's owned by either that individual or by the association or council, but it's also the benefits for health and other areas. So it's trying to see that that whole area should be more of an infrastructure and seeing it as one of the priorities that government has to achieve. And, I mean, it's not, you're right, it's existing Homes Alliance, it's Stop Climate Chaos, it's WWF, but even the uh, CBI just a couple of weeks ago said that energy efficiency should be a key infrastructure uh, priority for, and that was at kind of a, a UK level, we would say the same as well. It's seeing it as far more integral. It's not an issue in itself. It's about the well-being of people who live in housing and it's trying to improve the asset that those people live in. Okay. Any other contributions now? Um, I would fully support the idea that the work we do on energy efficiency and homes should go into the National Infrastructure Programme uh, to give it that importance and that it should be bigger. And one of the reasons, as well as the social reasons of tackling fuel poverty and making people's lives better, is that investing in people's homes is one of the quickest ways you can save carbon. So if we put in a, a package of insulation measures into someone's home tomorrow, mm -hmm. from tomorrow, that house is saving carbon. And it'll keep saving that amount of carbon every year as long as it stands. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, if we're trying to catch up with our targets, it's a great place to <coughs> invest. And the government has been good at talking about investing in money in one area and acknowledging savings in, in another area. And I think we're, we haven't gone quite far enough when we think about housing in that area, because if you make people's lives 
better, you improve the economy, you make them healthier, you save money in the health service, so, uh, and if you're insulating people's homes, then some builders have got some jobs, clearly. So there are lots of ways in which investing in the efficiency of people's homes improves uh, a, a lot of things across the economy and actually saves the government money in other parts of the economy. And I think we, we have acknowledged that to some extent. So the government has kept some of the money in efficiency programmes when it might otherwise have cut it for those reasons. But I think we haven't taken that analysis far enough to say actually there's a very significant health saving from not having people living in damp and mouldy homes. And actually we could take that out of the health budget and put it into housing because across the economy it would pay off. So we need to, we need to extend that logic a bit further to justify transferring money into a bigger spend on insulating people's homes. So you would advocate taking money away from the, the, health, the health budget and put it into... Um, Where we can clearly show that that will produce a saving. There are studies down south which show that for every pound you spend on insulating someone's home, you are saving money in the health service. Mm. So clearly there is a very strong imperative to protect the health budget. We all understand that. But where you can show that actually you're saving money that you would otherwise spend in the health budget by investing it somewhere outside of the health portfolio, whether that's in cycling, which make, makes people healthier, or in people's homes, because that makes them healthier, then clearly that, that's clear, very, very uh, worthwhile to consider. It's clearly seen, uh, as I believe, as part of the government's kind of prevention strategy. You're trying to prevent problems. You're yeah. investing in money to prevent problems elsewhere. And I don't think we've quite, as you said, made the links at times. People talk about, including government, talk about the benefits of you know warm, affordable, dry, damp-free homes. But, that, uh, I, but what we don't necessarily do is then say, well, if we invested in that, this would be the difference. This would be what we would save elsewhere in the health service. Yeah. So we, we talk about it, but it's about moving forward and making those links far clearer. Yeah. Oh, oh, I just come back to my original question. I was looking to see whether the 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 budget obviously has uh, has been allocated to reflect priorities the housing and regeneration budget and i'm asking you is it an appropriate allocation given what the priorities are within housing the area of housing and regeneration and i mean my response would be that that is good that that amount of money is, is in the budget. The difficulty is that it won't meet needs for those people up and down Scotland who are still trying to get access to housing. Mm -hmm. And it still is not enough to make the uh, houses energy efficient and to, and to tackle and eradicate fuel poverty. That's not saying that it's only about money. I recognise it's not only about money. There are other things as well. And that's where the discussion about minimum standards in private sector about the energy efficient standard in social housing, about changing behaviours mm -hmm. uh, of individuals, uh, owners and others, are all important, but resources are a key, key part of that. Okay. Karen, you want to say uh, yeah, if I can add to that... Um I think, I think one of the biggest challenges, I mean, local authorities, RSLs have got challenges to upgrade their own stock, but the, the biggest challenge I think we've got uh, um, is getting homeowners to think about, you know, to ch change their own behaviour. Um, new build homes are, are doing their bit, if you like, to, to create a, a more energy efficient product, and we'd love that to be in, in higher demand, mm -hmm. but customers unfortunately aren't acknowledging the what they can get back, the value um, of, of buying a more energy efficient product. Mm. So it's the builders that are hit in terms of the higher build costs without the value being increased. Think about, I mean, again, new build is a tiny proportion of our existing homes. If you look at the housing market, um, we need to think about how we can stimulate demand for energy efficient homes for people that are looking to buy homes, looking to, to sell their homes. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, the biggest missed opportunities um, the Scottish Government have had um, with the land and buildings transaction tax, fair enough, it's not a budget heading within the, the, the budget, but it, but it is a new scheme that's coming forward, a new regime, <coughs> is not to think about how they can... Well, take that back because they have thought about it, but, but not to introduce a way that they can align um, LBTC rates and bans with the energy efficiency of a home. Every home, whether it's a new home or an existing home, has got an EPC. And I think as much as um, 
a, a difference in what you pay in, in land and build instance action tax um, is not going to offset perhaps the capital investment in that home to make it more energy efficient, but it's going to get people talking about it and thinking about the decisions. Um, and that's, that's one missed opportunity. I think without taking budget away from, it, from anywhere else, that would have been one opportunity that the government had to, to really stimulate demand and get people to, to take action themselves to improve their homes. Okay, that, well, that's a useful point to bring up with the Minister when we, when we see her next week. Um, are there any other examples of good... Sorry, right. It's a related point, Mr Ingram, um, that there is a calculation produced by the World Health Organisation called the Health Economic Assessment Tool, HEAT, which is used to calculate the health benefits of active travel. There may well be one for housing as well. Um, but again, I think it's a, it follows the theme that Richard had mentioned earlier about um, acknowledging the benefit of the investment that we make. And our, our calculation is that the National Cycle Network gave benefits of 66 million for walking and 44 million for cycling uh, in 2013 based on that calculation. So it may well be that that's another element that needs to be somehow factored in when we're thinking about levels of investment that we make. Okay. Um, Coming back to the, the, point, the good practice, bad practice, would you make any, you, you've already made the point about the, the land and building transactions tax, um, are there any other um, areas where, which we should be looking at introducing a best practice or are there any areas of bad practice we need to get rid of? Uh, and is it, in the context of, of, of this draft budget? I think in terms of, I mean, in, in the home building industry, we've been working towards the, the roadmap um, for, for greener homes, if you like, through the Sullivan Report. And I think that's given us, you know, a sort of longer term horizon. It's also proven useful that, that the, the Sullivan panel, the government brought them together again to to look at how things have changed and, and to defer um, the new introduction of the standards, and that's to be welcomed. Now, that's given us, our industry, something to work towards and, and prepare, and I think that's good practice. In terms of the, the budget headings, it may not have a, a direct um, impact in one year, but I guess the good practice is, is setting a roadmap, um, which, which has really benefited our industry. Um, the... The, the difficulty we've got as an industry is it's easy to regulate our industry because we're new built, but we are at such a tiny proportion of the, the major challenge, which is the existing homes. Um, so I'll leave Alan to pick up, obviously, the, the budget allocation for that. I think good practice, again, the government should be praised in terms of the way that they have acknowledged that there is a higher build cost in terms of building above and beyond standards. So giving that extra 4K um, per unit, making that available as an incentive is, is really good, and as I said, that incentive is missing from the homes for sale market at the moment because there's no uh, premium attracted to, to valuations or the way, for example, a mortgage is assessed if you're buying a, a more energy efficient home. So that extra 4K, now I don't think that 4K um, is enough to cover the extra build costs. And in fact, the, the Scottish Government research shows that there's quite a, a range of costs uh, depending on the house type, but it's the incentive, and I think that incentive is good practice until you know, we are working in a, an environment, a housing market, where customers are demanding and expecting an energy-efficient product. We need to be incentivised to get there. Okay. The, uh, I would highlight a, a number of areas. The point that Karen made, I think, is really crucial, and I think affects all, all of you. And that's get, you know, getting owners to take responsibility, get owners, particularly in flatted accommodation, take a uh, take responsibility for whether it's communal repairs or in terms of energy efficiency. There is a culture change or behavioural change that we need to embark on. There are issues there, and that's not necessarily a resource, but it is a, it is a kind of an emphasis, a commitment to trying to ta tackle. All that. I think that, that ties into the whole advice and support. There is a lot of advice and support, including from government, but organisations like ChangeWorks, Energy Savings Trust, Energy Action Scotland, all prov providing a range of advice and support. And the difficulty is that there's just there needs to be more. Uh, wh whether it's individuals not understanding their heating system, not being able to use heating system, or whether it's uh, not don't have the advice 
uh, necessary on what boiler to look at. There is advice there. The question is, can we up that and, and Im improve on that? I think the, uh, the point that was made about tax is right. Uh, are there things that we could be looking at in future, whether it's through Devolution 2016 or through the Smith Commission, can we be looking at any further tax and the use of that tax in terms of incentives or to generate resources to fill gaps? And I think the other one in terms of good practice is that there are some associations and councils, whether it's Cuba and Glasgow or Aberdeen City Council, you're know, looking at the combined heat and power, uh, just the heating systems. Can we, um, uh, can we develop that further? Can we encourage more organisations not just to consider it, but actually to do something about it? So that's where there are, there are a whole number of things that are going on that are really useful. It's about trying to spread that more. That's good. Um, and you, you mentioned earlier on, I think it was Mr. Lauder, uh, about um, best practice internationally. And small countries have been particularly good. Uh, uh, maybe Scandinavian countries. Uh, are there any sort of models out there that we should be we should be looking at <coughs> importing in the, uh, for our own? I, I, I couldn't identify particular models just now, but I can I can provide information there. But I mean, my view is whether it's Scandinavia or whether it's the Netherlands, there are particular works, uh, particular areas going on about making houses energy efficient, about looking at uh, building an infrastructure from the outset that would be useful to consider. But I can certainly provide more information following this. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Just to follow on from that, um, in terms of new builds, um, the industry has been looking at examples abroad um, for a number of years. And, and in fact, in Scotland, um, we, we are quite advanced in terms of some of the off-site manufacturing facilities that are available. Unfortunately, in many cases, we're not building at high enough scale or building at enough volume um, to, to really get the, the payback from those schemes. And we've started a piece of work um, with the Scottish Government just now to look at you know, what will it take for builders to, to begin <coughs> to open up sites and looking at um, off-site methods of construction. Yeah. It's likely not the step change in building standards next year, um, which will we'll push it towards that, but the one after um, in 2019-20 in terms of um, the requirements. Um, and I, I, I guess um, we do have good examples. There's been numerous um, innovative pilot projects. Uh, there's been you know, the, the Innovation Park over in Fife. There's been the, the, um, the one in Inverness. There's been a number of things, but the, the challenge is mainstreaming it. And I think that's key. The... Um, Construction Scotland Innovation Centre um, that's got a lot of funding allocated to it recently. I think that's going to be a really big help in terms of working with industry to see how we can test things and bring them into the mainstream. Um, but again, it comes back to are we building enough homes are, are, to, to meet the, the, the needs and demands out there? And also, um, when you take the, the, the supply angle the other way, um, are people um, demanding the energy efficient products? Because we really need... Um, we really need people to start demanding it and for the uh, values to, to for there to be a market value yeah. um, attached to f to assist the builders um, in delivering that product because otherwise we're we're delivering a product which perhaps customers are not looking for yeah okay thank you very much can i just explore that a bit further before i bring mary in but you know it seems to me one of the few areas where um, sales doesn't drive um, behaviours because in anything else, you know, the builders would be marketing that and, and they don't. To be perfectly frank, builders do not market their houses in terms of their energy effic efficiency to any extent that they could. But to explore a bit further your written evidence on uh, LBTT, I mean, that would only apply to new homes because my understanding is that LBTT is paid by the buyer and it's the seller who would have increased, not in terms of new homes, but existing homes, and that's the biggest bulk of our sales transactions. It's the seller who would have made the improvements to the home, so they're not getting anything in terms of the, 
the tax. So it's, well, it's, it, it sounds like a good headline from Homes for Scotland, but in actual fact, there are lots of problems in introducing and in, in using LBTT can, to, to do that. I can imagine it's a massive challenge to, to try and cut, even come up with a formula is, is how you do it. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to assist the builder because it's not going to offset the costs. Um, it's not going to um, help the seller of the home because you know it's the buyer that benefits yes. the same way. That what it will do is act as a, an incentive to, to try and drive behaviours um, so that more people are looking in the market for energy efficient homes. As soon as there's a higher demand for that product, it will be reflected in the value. And that's what RICS has told us in terms of that they will not attach a value to an energy efficient home until it's what the customer is really looking for. Um, so it, it is what comes first. And I think that's one way where we can start to get people talking about it. I think if you compare it to the car industry, it's useful. I mean, when you're looking to buy a home, your, your tax per, per year is something... Sorry, if you're looking to buy a car, your tax per year is something that you think about. You also think about your miles per gallon. Um, it's easier to understand in the car industry. And I think the EPC has gone some way. That The fact that every home advertised, you have to state what um, EPC level it is. But until... We did, some, we did some research recently and, and nobody was paying attention to it. So I think until you attach something to it, something financial to it, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the beginning of it to get people to pay attention to it. Um, your, your opening comments, um, Maureen, I've, I've, when you opened that, that sentence, I can't remember, there was a point I was going to pick up. Um, okay, we can uh, maybe come back to it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mary, do you want to carry on? Convener, I want you to follow on um, the theme around best practice um, and best practice examples from the international community um, and, and how they could be used to change building standards. And I absolutely understand if you couldn't give me any examples today, but it would be helpful if we could, um, if it could be followed up with some examples of best practice and how that could be used to change building standards to have a positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions. But I suppose you may be, be able to answer to today um, what impact that would have on our existing homes, because the point, um, Alan, that you made earlier about the percentage of, of existing homes that we have that will still be in use by 2050, how will the building standards and changes in building standards impact on that? So specifically, if you could pick up that point, and Karen, perhaps if you could pick up the point around the incentives that are given for increasing energy efficiency, and should more be done about incentivising um, energy efficiency and new build, um, specifically through the Help to Buy scheme? I mean, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, as I say, New homes built today are already 70% more energy efficient. In Scotland, we've got high building standards. They're higher than England, uh, for example, and we're due another increase next year. Um, that's already a big challenge for our industry. Homes, homes are more expensive to build in Scotland than they are in England. Um, and that's an issue when we've got builders, volume builders working north and south of the border for them to look at their investment and where they will make it in terms of where they'll get the returns back. Um, so already we've come a long way in Scotland. Um, the linking, I mean, I think, I think for a while there, the Scottish Government looked at, at ways that they could link um, grants, um, the Innovation mm. Fund, for example, they, they were hoping that they could, they could incentivise people to go higher um, in terms of the building standards. But they soon, they soon realised that, that that's not going to get you your volume. Help to buy is such a short-term budget. Mm. It needs to be oven ready sites i guess you know that you don't ha it takes so long to bring a development on mm -hmm. the ground you won't have time to plan a development and bring it forward um, under higher standards uh, for example even next year's standards and still benefit from the help to buy um, if we had a longer term strategy um, that's maybe something the scottish government could look at um, but right now the homes that are being built for example, in the budget for 2015-16, for they, they'll already be on the ground, if you like. They will be coming forward very fast. Um, it's very unlikely that you could then apply a, a higher standard, if, if that's your mm. thinking, Mary, in terms of um, connecting that incentive mm -hmm. to it. Um, LBTT clearly is coming forward April um, next mm -hmm. year, and, and we'll have an, another financial year to run, so we had hoped that that would have been 
a link there, um, and then obviously ongoing for the new build sector. Okay, thanks for that. I think Alan. the um, the housing sector, uh, particularly the house association sector, I've I've always looked beyond Scotland. Uh, whether it's through SECODIS, which is the European Federation of Housing Providers, or example would be, be SABO in Sweden, which is the Swedish Federation of Housing, and look to them to see what's going on elsewhere. So looking at the glazing side of it, looking at the cladding side of it, looking at the insulation side of it, and trying to bring back. So the house association sector in particular, but not only that sector, have been very good at looking, abro looking beyond Scotland to see what's going on and what would be useful. And sometimes that's the actual saying, well, we wouldn't do that, would we? You know, um, but there are examples, I think, of where associations have come back from visits and say, well, this is the kind of thing that we could be looking to do. And that's all about it ties into your constituency. You're the few, few poverty ranges from something like 21 per cent in some local authority areas to 39 per cent in some areas. It's about what we can do to reduce, to tackle that fuel poverty, make homes in your constituencies, other constituencies, far more energy efficient, which reduces Fuel, bill, fuel bills and improves as well the health and uh, all of those living in the properties. So if we can learn from others, whether it's through federations or whether it's through other organisations, uh, with Pactorim in France who act as agents for improvement in private sector as well as providing uh, social housing, you know, it's looking to examples to see what can be used from elsewhere. I think, I think um, that's an interesting point, and our, our RSLs in Scotland um, are at the forefront of, of delivering um, under new technologies and things that can that can bring the energy efficiency. Um, one of the reasons they can do that is because they've got you know a guaranteed exit when they're building, and that's what makes it more difficult for the homes for sale market, um, where, for example, um, a lot of the the modern methods of construction for off-site manufacturing. It helps if, if you're building a lot of scale, and it also helps you build fast. So you could you could bring forward a development. Um, I think the the lessons of the past few years have shown us that builders sometimes need to turn off the production tap um, with, when the market demand drops, and the difficulty they would have if they if they built too much at scale too fast is the market's not there. Um, so the the. The RSL sector with the guaranteed exit, because you've got your, your tenants desperately waiting mm -hmm. um, to get into the home, and also the whole life costing issues as well. You could perhaps uh, take the um, investment through back through, mm -hmm. through the rents, uh, bearing in mind that the households will have lower fuel costs, um, whereas, as I keep going back to, in this for sale market, there's no incentive through the market value in terms of the return for the extra investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I move on now to talk about types of um, energy efficiency? Um, be because there is a very clear link between um, greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency and, and, and fuel um, poverty. And we heard last week that by adding solar panels to homes and using hot water tanks to store energy, um, we could make a, a massive difference. We could reduce the numbers of people that are in fuel poverty. Um, does the panel agree that this is a, a feasible thing to do and it's something we should be um, looking to expand? Um, so I mean, I'll start off. I mean, I think it's um, one uh, house organisations should be looking at that. Yeah. Two, uh, you were uh, private owners should be looking at that as well. The issue is the uh, affordability of it, that upfront cost. And it's also trying, and it's sort of linked to the point that Karen made, it's trying to see people get people to see the long-term benefits mm. of it, that that upfront cost will, over a period of time, lead to uh, savings. So I think there's still, one, there's an issue of resources, two, there's an issue of willingness to do mm. something about it by the provider, and three, there's an issue about, again, it ties to the behaviours of it, or the understanding, the awareness of individuals, whether that's tenants or whether that's owners, about the long-term benefits of that. But it's, it's something that we, I would agree that we should be trying to encourage. But just like it's, you know, we should be looking at, as I said earlier on, district heating, or just like we should be looking at how we can still improve solid wall, you know, insulation, we need to be looking at more at those from a new build point of view, um, I mean, our members would say that um, you know let's look at the fabric of the building and make it more energy efficient rather than 
um, forcing add-ons, um, which might not be as effective. The, the other thing is, you know, sometimes customers like to see see it as a, a you know a PV panel is something you can see and you can you can feel whether you know how to, to use it and maintain it is, a, is mm. another issue. But the the capital cost up front is is definitely um, an issue that needs to be considered. And I think the difficulty is it's it's. Customers are looking for guarantees in terms of the payback, and I'm not sure whether that's something that could be guaranteed. Richard might be able to give me some more stats on that. Um, but at the moment, it's very difficult, for example, of a member of staff in a sales office to explain to why a customer mm -hmm. might want to spend £5,000 or whatever it is extra on the home um, with PV panels, um, and, and this is what you will get, and also persuading your mortgage lender to will give you that extra funding um, to cover the extra capital cost. Um, Travelling around Scotland on the train, it delights me when I see solar panels on people's roofs, either PV panels making electricity or water heating panels, uh, because, as you were told last week, you can make a very significant saving. You can basically make all of your own electricity on average, and you can save 40 to 60% on your water heating if you've got a roof facing the right way. So it's a thing that makes a great deal of sense. But it also tremendously disappoints me to see new houses being built with a lovely south-facing roof with no solar panels on them. So it's a huge missed opportunity. And we need, to, we need to find a way to get over that capital cost at the start because those people living in those houses are going to save lots and lots of money. We need to get people to look at that in a different way or find a way to actually spread the cost so that people are very happy to buy a house which has either sort or both solar panels on the top. I think there's also a broader question about renewable heat. So solar panels making hot water are one of the technologies that's important. But we also have biomass heating, so wood chip or wood pellet boilers. We also have several sorts of um, uh, heat pump. And the government is sort of enthusiastic, but at the same time we're spending money extending the gas grid, which is competition for those solutions. So we need to be clearer about where we're really going on that. We have some reasonable targets for domestic uh, renewable heat. We have a UK incentive scheme, but it's not really taking off in the way that we would like it to, the way it needs to. So we need some more clarity on that. There are also other methods to bring these benefits to people. So if you don't have a south-facing roof, or you're in a flat which doesn't have any ownership of your common roof, then you can't take advantage directly. But there are solar co-ops, for instance. So in Edinburgh, there is brewing a solar co-op, which will deliver, uh, probably on council buildings, solar panels making electricity. Part of that scheme will be a community benefit fund. So renewable energy generated in the city will create a fund which will help people across the city to invest in energy efficiency or indeed invest in their own domestic renewables. So there are ways where you don't have the physical opportunity of having the right sort of roof or being able to install a, a heat pump of the right kind for you to benefit anyway because the community is doing something. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, can the panel give me um, any examples of missed opportunities where the, um, we, we could have developed more sustainable housing and communities and infrastructure across Scotland? Anything <coughs> specific or...? Any suggestions to improve? Um, we both referred, both Karen and I have referred to earlier on. I mean, there was a missed opportunity when government cut the uh, the money is going to a new development for house associations a couple of years ago. Thankfully, we've moved back. Yeah. You know, from that, because the, the impact of that meant that there were far fewer houses being developed on the social rented side of it, therefore not meeting the demand across Scotland. So that was a missed opportunity. Uh, and I think there are, it's that thing about, um, um, in terms of the resources that have been allocated, you know, the 70 million we talked about earlier on, but also the shortfall in, in eco. Mm -hmm. If we don't find other resources, there's a missed opportunity. And what we will do is that we will, in some way, we'll condemn people to continue to live in houses that are 
poorly insulated that cost a lot to heat and who are, continue to be fuel poor and that's a kind of a range of people and not, it's not just about tenants, that's about owners, that's about rural areas, it is off, you know, off grid uh, properties you know, there is a missed opportunity there in terms of trying to improve the well-being of many people in Scotland yeah. and, and I suppose that it, it kind of confirms the point that you made about looking at the health benefits of improving housing and linking it to other portfolios. So you could say that, that that's a missed opportunity as well, if more, more work was done on that. Yeah. Cam? I think given the environment we've been in for the past however many years, um, we've, we've done extremely well to, to get where we are in terms of the, the building standards regime. I think there's a huge balance to be struck between... Um, Given, given how you know, I outlined the, impact, the small impact that a new built home can make to the, the bigger picture, mm. if you like, um, and we really need more homes. And if it's a balance to be struck between um, a roof over someone's head or an extremely sustainable unit, and I think the priority has to be increasing housing supply, and we shouldn't underestimate how far we've already come. So we mm. are already extremely sustainable in terms of the homes that we are producing. Mm. Okay. John? Yeah, I think on the Sustainable Transport Fund, we've missed enormous opportunities in the past few years by focusing on cul-de-sac mm. uh, type dwellings, which is why designing streets is such, such a welcome um, planning policy. Um, we have almost designed out um, bus routes from some housing developments. We've built in a dependency on the car. We've failed to link up pub uh, public transport, especially new railway stations that have been opened to new build housing. That's been an error, it's a missed opportunity, but it's, it's where we are. We'll find a way through it. What's particularly welcome, but slightly worrying, is that designing streets doesn't seem to be getting delivered in the way that it could be delivered. And we still are constructing new build housing that doesn't simply link to sustainable transport. And the best example I can give you is if you're on the train between Glasgow and Edinburgh is to look at Croy Station and see how difficult it is for people living within sight of the station to walk simply to the station. It should be just dead easy. In any other country in Europe, it would be easy. It isn't here, and that's a missed opportunity. Can I just, I mean, maybe the example I would use, I, I, I have um, I know a number of housing colleagues who work in Hong Kong, uh, and, and what's interesting in Hong Kong is that the housing manager works for the transport organisation because what they do is they think about the transport, they think about housing mm. and they think about shopping as well and the other countries have done that and that's clearly uh, something that we have not done whether it's from the peripheral estates you know, that we've built in the 50s right mm. through to now and I do think that just now it's particularly some of the private sector developments I would have said Cumbernauld generally but Croy would be another you know, specific example of where we are, we are building the states of housing where you are, you need at least one car, if not two cars, to get out. There are very few facilities there. We don't do enough thinking, holistic thinking about what kind of communities we want, what do we need when we are building housing, when we are looking at schools, when we're looking at health service. We don't link that up enough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we move on to digital infrastructure, Alex. <coughs> convener. As the convener said, the issue of digital infra infrastructure. Uh, could I ask the panel initially to uh, basically give their judgment on the proposals contained within the draft budget in relation to greenhouse gas emissions and to other targets or objectives that the government have? Can I... Um um, uh, start off just by uh, thanking the convener and members for the, uh, the opportunity to come and, uh, uh, and give evidence today. Um, perhaps a, just a little bit of context about Community Broadband Scotland. Um, we um, uh, are run uh, and operated by Highlands and Highlands Enterprise, who are delivering a national programme um, on behalf of, of the Scottish Government. Um, did you listen in this morning to, to the evidence of, of my colleagues? Um, digital is so is so cross cutting whether it's it's smart metering or reducing travel journeys, um, encouraging businesses and and individuals to, to 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 trade from home and consolidate and travel. It, it's it's so cross cutting a, a, across the uh, the focus of of of, of the committee's deliberations. Um, uh, I, I think the. You know, we, we welcome uh, the increase uh, contained within the budget for the uh, the next generation digital fund. 
Um, we, uh, as, as Community Broadband Scotland, are also working very closely um, with the government. We've been identified as one of the, the key uh, delivery partners to, to, to access European funding to, to, to help go further. I think our role is to reach the part that the digital uh, uh, Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme uh, won't reach. Um, as members will be aware, um, there's £410 million being invested uh, across Scotland. Um, that investment will reach 84% of, of premises in the Highlands and Islands area and 96% of, of premises um, in, in, in the rest of Scotland. Our role is to work with communities, to help communities, to provide a wraparound service, to, to help communities to deliver um, an increased um, uh, broadband solution. The, the budgets that we currently have certainly won't enable us to do that for, for the whole 120,000 uh, premises that, that will require uh, our services across Scotland. Um, but we are working with colleagues in, in government to access various strands of European funding um, and uh, funding via BDUK through the Superfast Extension Programme to, uh, to increase that funding to, to, to bring this, this transformational connectivity to, to remote and, and, and rural Scotland. So is the budget doing its job, do you think? It's, it's certainly doing its job uh, at the current time. We, we've, um, so far, we've, we've funded seven communities that have delivered 750 transformational connections. Um, the, the, the challenge to date ha has been uh, more about the business model within those communities, um, making sure that the solutions that are delivered are, are sustainable. Um, the, the communities that we have um, delivered funding to to date have, have been very much self-starting. There's people within those communities who, who understand the technology, who deliver. They've had access to, um, to projects like Tagola that have been running without our support for a long time um, and um, in, in, in Neudart um, and uh, projects like Hebnet in the Small Isles who have helped them to develop and we've helped them and we've, we've, we've helped develop them. We are running a pilot at the moment in the Argyle Isles which, which aims to aggregate demand. Um, we've done an awful lot of supplier engagement um, which indicates to us that, that really you need around a thousand properties to, to get suppliers to come in and run a service over um, over a community owned network and, and prevent the community from um, from having to to run up hills and fix masts themselves which which lots don't don 't want to do um, that it, the response from the market is very encouraging we 're out to tender at the moment, and this aggregated approach will then require additional funding in 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 the next two to two to three years. Um, we've identified sources of funding and we're working with government partners at the moment to, um, uh, to deliver that funding. <laughs> the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Department will retain responsibility for uh, how we develop this, but one of the features of the budget is that the Next Generation Digital Fund has been transferred into the Rural Affairs Food and Environment Portfolio. Uh, to what extent does that affect the ability of infrastructure and capital investment to monitor the effectiveness of the current and future digital infrastructure programme? I think, uh, you know, operationally we, we work very, very closely with both of the, the Digital Scotland Superfast broadband teams to ensure that, uh, you know, what we are delivering is, is, is complementary to the, to the £410 million that is being invested uh, a, across Scotland. Um, my understanding was that that's not a change from from previous years, but 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 I, I may be I may be wrong on uh, on that. Mm. The most of the people that we are delivering to as Community Broadband Scotland are in remote and rural um, areas. Um, uh, you know, they so it has a relevance uh, to what you're doing. Uh, th th there is a relevance to, to to what we are doing. I think operationally, though, it, it, for us, it has it has very little impact. We we work very closely, as I say, with the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband teams and. Um, uh, and ensure that, that we are leveraging that investment for the benefit of the community schemes that, that, that we are supporting, mm -hmm. uh, be they rural or, or, or near rural. Yeah. Earlier, uh, when we were discussing transport issues, I think it was uh, uh, Mark Tate who uh, gave us some suggestions about how uh, uh, broadband infrastructure could contribute to more efficient use of rural transport. But I wondered if the, the, there was uh, anybody across the panel who had anything further to comment on how the use of digital infrastructure can actually help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions in transport. So there's a key principle in thinking about sustainable transport 
we often think about, well, is someone going to drive or are they going to go on a bicycle or are they going to take a bus? But the step before that, of course, is are they going to step out the door at all? So how do we give people access to the services they want to access without them having to travel? Mm -hmm. So, of course, digital is a, a huge help, sometimes a minor hindrance, but usually a huge help in that. Uh, so coming back to that principle, uh, yes, digital is potentially a huge saver of carbon in terms of giving people to access to the services that they uh, now don't need to travel to. So 15 years ago, people would drive to a video shop to get a video, if you remember videos, and then drive home and watch it. Now, all of that comes through their television. Indeed. So that journey doesn't happen. They might drive for something else, but that journey doesn't need to happen because that service is provided in a way that means you don't need to travel. So more of that is very helpful. That's exactly what I was going to say. Home working, for example, do you need to travel? Uh, do you need to make a long journey for a two-hour meeting when you could have the two-hour meeting? either at home or at your desk in your office rather than travel to London or Bristol or, or indeed Edinburgh. <coughs> that would be one. The second one, real-time information that's available on your smartphone uh, is excellent and it definitely, I think, makes public transport more relevant, easier to use. Um, finally, high-quality online mapping. What are, the op what are the options that are available to make a short trip? And the more we talked before about choice and transport, what are the choices that are available? The more we make those choices attractive and interesting, and particularly for, I think, that the generation who, who take smartphones is just normal. They're not exceptional. It's what you use all the time. By adding in some of the really excellent mapping apps that are there, very, very useful. On the sustainable transport front side, um, the, the budget for res, uh, revenue funding is so very tight it's quite difficult to develop that type of technology. I think if there was more slack and there was more availability of revenue budget, you would see more uh, online mapping available, I think, for a higher... Because uh, it's largely regarded as something you don't pay for. So the, the public expect it to be free. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there needs a budget to help it to grow. I think there are lots and lots um, of examples in the in the communities that we've supported. If, for example, there's a community project in Loch Eelnet around Apple Cross, which has now has two, 200 uh, transformational connections to, to, to homes and businesses, and you know just just small examples like there's there's a. Um, a music recording studio there and rather than use couriers to transport digital files backwards and forwards which they had to do in the past they now use, use file transfer over the internet so there's one journey that just doesn't happen anymore um, but just people doing home shopping it's a very very simple example but it aggregates that journey into one journey to deliver uh, to deliver to them um, there's there's an example of a, a young student who used to have to travel into Fort William to use his grandmother's internet connection doesn't have to make that journey anymore I mean, back to the original question when we started, it, it makes it incredibly difficult to measure because people are making different choices about, uh, about, uh, about how, they, how they behave. Um, so it's difficult to measure how they would have behaved if, uh, uh, if, if they didn't have that infrastructure in place. It's not the first time I've asked that question to a panel, and I have to say every time I ask it, I get more and more interesting answers <laughs> than I expected to get. Now, moving on slightly, last week uh, when we were questioning another panel, uh, we heard the suggestion that opening up the main fibre in infrastructure uh, in Scotland to competition would be a big boost for expanding superfast broadband across the country. What's the panel's views on that idea? I think, I mean, if I can just talk a little about the, the, the investment that's, that's being made in the core digital infrastructure, and, and particularly in the, in the Highlands and Islands, there's an investment in, in a new fibre infrastructure that is 1200 kilometers of, of, of new fiber is, is being laid through the BT contract um, 800 kilometers of that or, or subsea it's, it's quite an, an audacious investment um, where there is, is public investment into a new fiber infrastructure um, the duct that, that that fiber has to go down has to have I believe it's four channels so so three channels are available for competitors to come along and to and to, to, to basically blow their own fiber through that through that infrastructure so there is open access to that new infrastructure that has has been created there's a more to be done though um, I, I mean there there is always there was always always more to be done and I, I think in all honesty what we're fishing for here is is the current legislation adequate to achieve that or do we need to consider legislating in that area somewhere yeah, yeah. Um, I think you know the 
the, the, the current uh, legislation, which is, a, I think, as you heard um, and discussed last week, which is a, a UK um, um, uh, power, uh, says that all public investment that is going into uh, infrastructure at the moment has to be open access. So if, even if a community builds a mass that, that, that we provide funding for, that has to be open access. They have to open that up. And the mobile infrastructure project, the, the maps, that are, the masts that are being built have to be, have to be open access. So that, that's, that's, that's where, we, where we sit at the moment. Before we leave the subject and go on to any, anything else, uh, is there uh, anything in relation to the, the issue of digital infrastructure which you want to suggest at this time should have been in this budget uh, and should be in the next? Can, can I possibly highlight an issue? I mean, I think what's been said so far are the advantages. The difficulty is that there are still many, particularly those in social housing, who are digitally excluded. Mm -hmm. And some of the work that, again, some organisations have done, and I would highlight Queen's Cross and some work they did around looking at their own tenants and found a far um, lower percentage who were digitally um, um, in included than they anticipated. I think the whole welfare reform changes and that kind of online claiming has brought that to a head. So there's more that we need to do so that everyone have the benefits that we've talked about, about being digitally included and the benefits that arise from that. But there are many people just now who are, who are digitally excluded and we can do more around that. Yeah, I think. I mean, you, I, I know you heard last week about some good work that's going on in the, the Glasgow Housing uh, Association um, uh, around digital inclusion. Um, the projects. I mean, for example, in in uh, in, in Loch Eelnet, in Applecross, and in other projects that we've been involved in, um, we've worked with other agencies like Citizens Online by, by Highlands and Islands Enterprise to make sure that there is some training for people on how to use this infrastructure because the. You know, the digital infrastructure uh, won't transform much. It's how you use it that, that, that is transformational. And, and, and we work closely with, with partners to ensure that where the infrastructure is installed, and I know with the main contracts as well, there's, there's a lot of demand stimulation and participation work that's, that's following the, um, the actual physical infrastructure rollout. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you very much. Last week, uh, well, we've heard uh, in, earlier on in this session about the um, regulations that uh, we have on new built houses. But I think um, the um, Rural Affairs Committee heard that you know it isn't in, it isn't absolutely necessary for new built housing to have broadband connection. Should it have? I think that comes down to the, the, the infrastructure provision. Um, I, I would be surprised. Um, have any new built homes been built for sale yet, certainly, because of the demand from customers. Um, but again, it depends on, on where the homes are being built and what, what facilities and infrastructure there are in, in that area. Um, I know that um, even the, the, the provision of uh, homes in the public sector, um, you know, the, it is something that they do, they do, they do look at um, in terms of connections. You know, they've got it in their, their design spec in terms of the connections and things that must go into the home. But again, it, it very much depends on the infrastructure that's available. I think that's right. The, as I said, the investment that's going into this backbone infrastructure is, um, is substantial at the moment, and that will enable um, things like that. I think if you were to turn around to a house builder at the moment and say, you know, you have to provide um, super fast broadband for a new building, uh, the Slate Peninsula in Sky, they'd, they'd face the same challenges that we face in, in terms of getting that community connected because the infrastructure is, is, is not there just yet uh, to support that. Okay. Anybody else got anything on broadband? No. Finally, then, if we move on to Jim, you've got some final questions. Thank you. And good morning. Um, the government's um, climate change targets, obviously, are, are ones that we would all share in terms of their ambition to reduce um, emissions reduction targets uh, by 42% by, by 2020 and 80% by 2050. But if I've understood the, the written submissions and the evidence that you've given this morning, you don't have confidence that we can meet those targets based on the current budget um, allocations. And in fact, Mr Dixon, you suggested that um, those allocations may be taking us in the wrong the wrong direction in terms of reducing carbon. What would we have to do, and I'm, I'm conscious that you 
be repeating uh, some of the things you've said already this morning, but it's an opportunity to, to reiterate and to reinforce those messages. But what more do we need to do to get back on track? And are you confident that we can make up the shortfall in terms of failing to meet the, the targets between 2010 and 2012? Thank you. So there is no technical reason why we can't meet the targets. Um, the target for 2020 in the Act is at least 42%, and we tend to forget about the at least. Um, the difficulty we've had meeting the, the first three targets, which are the only ones we have results for, so we only have 2010, 2011, and 2012. The difficulties have been different each time, so there are um, good reasons to have some sympathy for the government in terms of it was a cold winter, and that makes more people use fuel at home, uh, and that some of the baseline numbers, so we're, we are calculating how we are comparing ourselves to 1990, the 1990 numbers have been recalculated, which has actually made it harder for us to meet the targets. So I would certain, <coughs> certainly have some sympathy that things have got a little harder than we thought they were. But there is no question that we are still not trying hard enough in terms of our policy effort to deliver. So this plan, the RPP2, as I suggested, it's a very impressive piece of work and probably no one else in Europe has got one of these. Um, it doesn't actually meet all of the targets between now and 2020, but it gets pretty close, so it could be better. But as I said, we've got to deliver on all of it. And I think I said also that we, we know how to do this. So this plan here <coughs> spells out lots of things we're already doing. And we know in housing, we know how to make people's houses much more energy efficient. Uh, we know how to do solid wall insulation for properties which are harder to treat, but we're not putting much money into that, and we're, as Alan suggested, we're not compensating for the fact that the UK scheme, ECO, has deprioritised that and is spending less money. So we're not catching up in some areas where things are going a bit off track, quite obviously. So, as I say, no, there is no technical problem in meeting this. The question is, do we put enough political will into making sure that the budget each year invests in the measures which reduce carbon and doesn't invest in too many measures which increase carbon, like roads and bridges. And those are political choices, and we will all tell you that the choices which are pro-reductions in carbon are also pro-people, because they're about stopping fuel poverty, they're about pe making people happier and healthier in their homes, they're about making people fitter because they cycle or walk more, they're making people actually more content because they don't have to own a car because public transport becomes better or more affordable and they're able to make a journey that they used to make by car by public transport. So there's a, there's a positive vision of the world where we are a low-carbon society, the economy benefits, people feel better about themselves and the world because of that. And that's the direction we would like to go in. I've talked about in these tight budget times where we might look at the pre preventative spend principles and say that there are some big pots of money which could contribute to increasing some of the good things we already do to make them bigger, because we will save in the health budget, budget for instance. So, although that's somewhat politically difficult territory to go into, if you can quite clearly say you will save this much because people will be healthier, because their homes are better, or because they cycle and walk more, then you can say, well, actually, we could take a bit of money from the health budget to invest in that, because it's good for all of us in the long term. So... I think that's my overall message. We can, we can get there. There's no problem getting there. But we are not on track to get there. And this budget probably is uh, not going to contribute enough to get us back on track. So we can get there, but we need to try harder. So I would like to see this budget improved before it's finally agreed by Parliament and certainly future budgets to show us much more of a, a step change, which is what the UK Committee on Climate Change called for, in policies on transport, energy, waste and housing, which will take us very clearly back onto track and make sure that we deliver on the 2020 target and set us on track for at least 80% and hopefully more by 2050. If we can take it that you've spoken on behalf of the panel in terms of reiterating um, what needs to be done, I'm interested you used the phrase that we're not trying hard enough in terms of our policy effort. Could I ask each of the panel members a question that I asked the panel last week, which was, if there was one innovation that you could choose 
in terms of policy development, legislation, investment in infrastructure or good practice, uh, what would that be and what would the resource implications of that or the funding um, requirement um, be to implement that? I'll have a go at that one. Um, first of all, I, I, do, I don't think you need to try any harder on the policy side. It's delivering the policies that's the, the thing that we need to do more of. I think we have the policies. We have more than enough. They're excellent. Um, one thing that could be done, would I think, would be to follow the example of local authorities like Fife, who have made all residential and shopping streets 20 miles per hour. We can do that. I think it would be the right thing for government to lead on it. It's fairly uh, inexpensive to do. Um, I think the powers already exist, and if they don't, it may well be that the submission to the Smith Committee would allow that to happen. We know that one of the major reasons that people do not are not attracted to making short trips by bicycle is that they find the road network in residential areas quite gladiatorial, really, and not very pleasant even when they're driving. Uh, if they're sitting in a bus, they're looking at traffic, they don't much fancy cycling either. In addition, pedestrians find the acceleration and deceleration of cars to get to the magic 30 miles per hour really intimidating, particularly older people. And that's a disincentive to walk to. So I think if we were looking for a preventative measure that was very cost effective, making that a blanket right across Scotland, it'll be 20 when you're in a residential or a shopping area, would be a very sensible, cost-effective thing to do. And do you have a, a figure for how much it would be to implement that change? Um, I don't, but I'm very happy to come back to the committee quickly with what I think that might be. Um, I was going to say that one of the key things that we can do, and indeed government is looking at, is set standards. Um, and so whether it's the energy efficient standard and social housing, or whether it's the minimum standards in the private sector, though that would take us on a kind of step change. Now, that means that a number of things. One, that means we need to promote it. So if we're going to set standards in the private sector, and it's going to be in a few years' time, we need to be telling people that, promoting that, giving advice on that. There is a resource issue, um, but a resource issue may well be that government did consider uh, a loan fund for private sector a number of years ago and stepped back from that. It may well be that that's the kind of thing we should look at again uh, as a loan fund, particularly for owners who are on lower incomes. It's how you incentivise that. So you're setting standards, but you're incentivising that. And one of the things you could do that is look at the kind of loan side. And so we would be saying to government, we have said to government, is you need to consider that national lending unit again, as you did a number of years ago. From the housing new build point of view, um, I think if we are failing on the RPP, it's simply that there would be an assumption for the number of homes that are being built and the contribution they would make, and perhaps we're, we're not meeting that because I mean, clearly we're, we're not building enough homes. Um, I think the budget as it stands has the potential to address that with the extra £125 million for housing supply, uh, for that to be used wisely and obviously help um, achieve the other um, important outcome um, measurable in terms of the number of increasing the number of homes being built. Um, I think, as I said previously as well, use of LBTT would have been really interesting to see how we could start stimulating, and it, it would be a start stimulating demand uh, for for um, greener or energy efficient homes. And again, that would assist Alan's comment in terms of the private sector and owner occupiers and how we really do get them started to think about their own homes and how they could make a difference. I think um, making a loan fund available um, may be helpful, but my understanding from the, the loans that were available, is it, was, it, was it Green Deal? My expertise is not existing homes. Um, but well, What would the size of that loan fund have to be, either yourself or Mr Ferguson? Sorry, I can't... What would, this, what would this, the, the amount of size of that loan fund have to be to have the impact that you desire? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll get the answer to you. Right. So just in conclusion, I think the budget as it stands has the potential to assist housing supply, which will make our um, contribution work. There's no particular innovation that you... 
I think we've already to... come such a long way in terms of our building standards. Um, they're already really high. We've already made a huge improvement. That there, there's no particular um, innovation other than increasing the number that we're building. I think the innovation needs to come in the existing homes where the huge challenge lies. Okay, thank you. I think um, innovation in in terms of broadband provision, and particularly rural um, uh, uh, and remote broadband provision, is is not actually about the technology. It's about it's about the business models that support the delivery of that that broadband service. Um, we uh, and it's about opening up um, access to, um, to to the pipe, as as Professor Former described it last year, that that provides these these broadband services. We are doing a lot of work with. Um, with all people who own fibre uh, across Scotland, um, and we hope to announce a pilot where we're, uh, we will be announcing very shortly a pilot um, to access fibre, um, which is not core fibre that's being delivered through the BT contract, but owned by another supplier, um, which will transform a community project and will deliver next generation broadband for, for, for that project. So the innovation is around, is, around the, um, is around the sustainability and around the business models for those communities to access next generation broadband. In terms of costs, our you know, at the moment, our costs are running at around £800 per connection for the, the connections that we've enabled um, to deliver truly next-generation connections. Then, then you know, an estimate would be between £1,000 and £1,500 per, per, per connection. Is there a global cost that you can...? I think, well, for those um, premises who are, who are not going to be connected to a, a next-generation broadband infrastructure, as I say, there's around 120,000 of them, those... And we are working closely with with the two. Um, you know, there are there are funds available through the Superfast Extension Program, some through various European programs. Um, so it's not all about community broadband. Has, has been identified as a key delivery partner for for some of these funds, um, but it's also about extending the reach of the of the BT contracts um, that exist at the moment. And 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 we're working with with government, with the the, the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Team, the Digital Scotland Team, and with COSLA to identify exactly how how those funds will be best spent. It depends on the solution. It, the fibre to the premise is billions. Uh, a wireless next generation solution is, is less. Mm -hmm. Do you want the final word, Mr Dixon? Thank you, Alan. Let's come back to Alan mentioning the minimum standards for homes at the point of sale or rent. I think that would drive people who haven't been interested or haven't been bothered to think about energy efficiency to take that up in a much bigger way. And that could be linked not just to energy efficiency, but carbon, so it would make them think about renewable energy in the home as well, where that was appropriate. And at a bigger scale, it would make society think more about district heating. So minimum standards in the homes market, I think, would be transformational. Okay. Anyone else want to say anything? Members have got any more questions? All right, folks, thank you very much for your contributions today. It's been very helpful and will feed into um, our budget uh, report. Uh, can I suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave the room? Thank you.
Right, uh, we'll just uh, resume the meeting then. Uh, I, agenda item three is public petitions. Uh, this is to consider public petition PE1481 on blacklisting in Scotland. The committee is invited to consider a letter from the Scottish Government dated the 8th of October 2014 on what actions it wishes to take in respect of this petition. Can I invite the views or comments of members on this petition? Jim. I think this petition has been incredibly valuable and that the petitioners have provided a, a very useful service in placing the issue of blacklisting very firmly on the policy and legislative agenda. And as a result of the petition, a number of things have happened. Uh, the government has uh, developed guidance in collaboration with the trade unions. The Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014, which was considered by this committee and debated both in, uh, in the committee and in Parliament, um, gives ministers the ability to bring forward statutory guidance, um, which is about how public bodies must take uh, blacklisting into account when awarding um, contracts. And the government, in the course of that legislation, gave a clear commitment to place guidance developed with the trade unions on a statutory footing and also gave a clear commitment to bring forward um, secondary legislation. There's also the issue of, uh, uh, highlighted in the, the letter from the Deputy First Minister about the transposition of uh, European procurement directives in this area. So it does look as if, as a result of this petition, that there is a, a framework that has been developed which provides a... Um, a number of ways in which the issue of blacklisting can be addressed. And for those reasons, I think that the petitioners have done a, a very good job. I think that this committee has done its job. The petitioners have done their job. And I, I think that the obvious conclusion is that we should close uh, the petition. But I think in doing that, we would have to place on record a debt of gratitude to the trade unions in particular, uh, to Pat Rafferty of Unite, Harry Donaldson of the GMB, and Harry Frew of UCAT uh, for the work that they've undertaken. And I think we'd also have to place on record the fact that the Scottish Affairs Committee uh, at Westminster has done very valuable inquiry into this issue, uh, which has informed the debate about blacklisting. And we'd also have to recognise that there is ongoing dialogue between the Scottish Government and the trade unions in taking this issue forward. Uh, but because of the progress that has been made and because of the work that's been undertaken, I think the obvious conclusion is that we should close the petition. Okay, Mark? Yeah, I would agree with... Um, almost all of what Jim has said there. There has been a, a large amount of work in, in terms of investigation um, done by the Scottish Affairs Committee. The, the government has taken the agenda forward um, through the, the procurement reform bill, but the, there is still the issue of, of contracts being awarded just now um, through the NHS, through the hub codes, um, through local authorities to companies who have been involved in the practice of blacklisting, who haven't come um, and, and carried out their remedial act, action and, and that in itself is, is ill-defined as to what the government expects that remedial action to be. I think it would be um, I think we wouldn't be doing our, our duty if we were to close this petition when that work is still ongoing, that when um, the government do plan to undertake a consultation and then bring forward that secondary um, legislation, I think we should um, keep this open until the process that the government is committed to going through um, has, has been completed to see if we then satisfied the aims and ob objectives of the petitioners. Anyone else? Can I just um, very briefly convene it? I mean, I absolutely agree with everything um, that, that Jim said, apart from um, closing the petition. And, and it is for the reasons that, that, that Mark has, um, has gone into. While there is still other work going on, until the guidance is put in a statutory footing, until the transposition of, of these other things are done, I would be reluctant to close this. I think it's something that's so important that we need to keep a watching brief on it and keep it open until the completion of the consultation and, and the, the guidance being put in a statutory footing. Quite entitled to your opinion, but you know, I think this is go going to be done in the context of us looking at the procurement mm. regulations. Mm. Um, 
And the other thing that I would point out is that we've given the witnesses a number of opportunities to respond to what we've done, and they haven't come back to us, which m might make me think that, you know, because they're being consulted to a great extent on uh, drafting the guidance um, on the blacklisting, which is going to be made statutory, that maybe that's the avenue that they're pursuing now, so that, you know, we probably could con close the petition. Anyone else want to make any comment? So should we close it? Committee is, but what would be the benefit in keeping? I mean, as far as I can see, we've done our job as a committee. I mean, is there any guidance the clerks can provide in terms of what our ongoing role and involvement would be in this issue? It's very much for for members to decide what their role might might be in this. Obviously, you've, the procurement um, bill has, has has gone a long way to, to answering some of the questions raised in the in the petitions. But it's very much for you to. To, to decide whether or not you think this is worthwhile to keep open, obviously minding that, that you, you are keeping a, a watching brief on the procurement um, regulations as they come in uh, later on. I, mean, I think even even since the procurement bill, there seems to have been, you know, massive steps taken in the fact that it's now going to be made. The guidance is going to be made statutory, and the the unions are involved in, you know, drawing up the guidance. So, do we really need to keep it open? I mean, if I'm sure <laughs> the folk involved, Pat and others, would be the first to come back to us with another petition if they thought it was required. Okay, so can I have some steer on this without having to go to a vote? Are we going to keep it open or shut it? Alex, you haven't said anything. I'm keeping my mouth shut in case <laughs> anything I say might influence the argument one way or another. The, I'm, I'm inclined to go with Jim, uh, but that's not for any particular political reason. It's simply for the reasons Jim stated. I mean, if I was to say, look, when the when the procurement regulations come, because they will come as statutory instruments, you know, we'll make sure that we have time and everything to go through them properly. But, I mean, we do that anyway, but you know, that, that we might flag them up. You know, to make sure that members have read them properly and everything before they come, would that be sufficient for Mary and Mark? I mean, I've, I've been in touch with the, the petitioners about it. I know there's still that, that particular concern mm -hmm. about the contracts that are still being awarded to the companies who've mm -hmm. been involved in blacklisting. I, I think if we were going to give um, that secondary legislation due consideration. I, I don't know, um, perhaps the clerks can, can advise on whether we would scrutinise that purely as, as a committee or whether there'd be a role for any evidence um, taken as, as part of that. We just, just for the committee's um, help, we would do everything we could to raise the context of the petition. Um, while those procurement regulations were going through, so that you're aware of how those regulations were 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 affecting what has been what had been put forward in the bill, mm -hmm. so that it, it it was very much at the forefront of your of your consideration. And would would there be the opportunity for the petitioners to give evidence at that point? We could the committee could decide to invite them to give evidence if they thought that was appropriate at at, at that juncture. I mean, I would be happy. To to close on the basis that we write and say that this, we've received a letter from the Deputy First Minister and that we've looked to consult the petitioners at the point of um, that statutory guidance being lodged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Agree on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, we now move into private session. <laughs>